Hello everyone, welcome to this virtual talk. My name is Namrata. I'm a third year PhD student at the University of Warwick. I'm going to be talking about Hamiltonicity problem in Knesser graph. This is a joint work with Arturo Merino and Tostad Mutze. So let me start by introducing what a Knesser graph is. It has a two parameters, n and k. The vertices are the k elements subset of set 1 to n and edges are the pair of sets such that they are disjoint. For example, a complete graph is a Knesser graph with k equals 1. So in this case, the vertices are the singleton set and since all these sets are disjoint, we join each vertex with every other vertex and hence what we get is a complete graph. The second example is a Peterson graph when n is 5 and k is 2. So in this case, the vertices are the two elements subset of set 1 to 5 and we put an edge between two vertex, two vertices when the corresponding subset are disjoint. We assume that k is at least 1 and n is at least 2k plus 1 for a Knesset graph to be non-trivial. Now let me tell you the origin story of Knesset graphs. So in 1955, Knesset conjectured that if the k subset of a n set are divided into n minus 2k plus 1 classes, then two disjoint subsets would end up in the same class. And in order to prove this conjecture, Lovash in 1978 introduced these Knesset graphs and proved that the chromatic number of the Knesset graph is equal to n minus 2k plus 2, which means that if we divide the n subsets of n set into n minus 2k plus 2 classes, then two disjoint subsets would not end up in the same class. These graphs are vertex transitive, meaning that the graph looks the same from the point of view of every vertex. And Lovash already has had a conjecture from 1970 that every connected vertex transitive graph admits a Hamilton cycle with five exceptions. And one of them is the Knesset graph when n is five and k is two, which is the Peterson graph. So thus, Knesset graph being a vertex transitive graph, they form a very special case of, for this general conjecture of Lovash's from 1970. Now, Hamiltonicity in Knesset graphs has been widely studied over the last few decades. So in the next two slides, I will review some of the important results. Okay, so let's start with dense Knesset graphs. We say that a graph is dense when n is large with respect to k. So the first result in the 10th Knesset graph was done in 1978 by Henrich and Wallace. And they proved that when n is at least one of one plus O1 k squared by ln2, the Knesset graph is Hamiltonian. And this result was improved in 1987 by B, Chen and Lee. And they proved that when n is at least one plus O1 k squared by log k, the Knesset graph is Hamiltonian. Another breakthrough came in the year 2000 when Y Chen proved that when n is at least 3k, Knesset graphs are Hamiltonian and she improved this bound to 1 plus O1 times 2.62k. And she plus and for a D in 2000, they gave a short proof for the cases when n equals ck for all c at least 3. Now, let me give you some of the Hamiltonicity results in the sparse Knesset graphs. So, sparse cases when n equals 2k plus 1. Okay? And such graphs are called odd graphs. That is, when n equals 2k plus 1, the Knesset graph is also known as an odd graph. And in the year 1972, 73, and 79, three different people, Meredith, Lloyd, and Biggs, they conjectured that every odd graph admits a Hamilton cycle, with one exception, namely, the Peterson graph. So these Peterson graphs, they admit a Hamilton path, but not a Hamilton cycle. So these exceptions will keep up, we will keep coming in every conjecture and theorems going forward. So 45 years later, Mudze, Naman Palo, and Walshok, in the year 2021, they proved that all these odd graphs are indeed Hamiltonian, again with the exception of the Peterson graph. And using the conditional result from Johnson in the year 2011, these authors, they extended their results for all the cases when n equals 2k plus 2 raised to a. 
such that a is at least zero. So from the last two slides, we see that when n lies in the interval starting from 2k plus 3 and ending at 1 plus 01 times 2.62k, when n is not equals to k plus 2 raised to a, we do not know in such cases that the Nisha graphs are Hamiltonian or not. So in this work, we actually can give a construction for the Hamiltonian cycle in the Knesset graph for all these open cases of n and hence prove, prove that all Knesset graphs are Hamilton for k at least 1 and n at least 2k plus 1. Again, unless when n equals 5 and k equals 2, which is the Peterson graph. And this settles the Hamiltonicity problems of Knesset graphs in full generality. Our second result is about generalized Johnson graphs. So let me explain what they are. They have three parameters, n, k, and s. The vertices are the same as the Knesset graph, which is the k element subset of set 1 to n. And edges are the pairs of sets a, b, such that the size of the intersection is exactly s. Okay. So it is easy to see that when s equals 0, we get Knesset graphs from the generalized Johnson graphs. Okay. Similarly, when s equals k minus 1, we get ordinary Johnson graphs from the generalized Johnson graphs. Okay. And these graphs are also vertex transitive. Okay. Now using theorem 1, we also get another result which says that the generalized Knesset graphs are also Hamiltonian for all k at least 1 and n at least 2k plus 1 unless n k s are 5 to 0 or 5 3 1 which are again the Peterson, which is again the Peterson graph. And this result settles the Hamiltonicity problems for graphs, which are defined by intersecting set systems. Now, let me give you a proof outline for the construction of Hamilton cycle in Knesset graphs. So, we construct a Hamilton cycle in basically two steps. So, in the first step, we construct a cycle factor. So V, which is a collection of cycle that covers all the vertices of the Knesset graphs. And this construction works for n at least 2k plus 1. Okay. So once we have all these different cycles in a cycle factor, the next step is to join them, to glue them together into one cycle. So recall that um, the sparsest open cases when n equals 2k plus 3. So for gluing these different cycles together into one, the assumption that n is at least 2k plus 3 is important. Now let me give you the construction of the cycle factor. Okay, so before going further into that, uh, we want to have a different representation of the vertices of Knesset graphs. Okay? So a k subset of n is represented by a binary string of length n with k many ones. Okay? For example, when n equals 11, k equals 4, the set x equals 4, 7, 8, 10 is represented by a binary string of length 11 such that 1s are present at positions 4, 7, 8, and 10 in this binary string. Okay. So in this picture, we have represented 1 by filled boxes and zeros by unfilled boxes. Okay. Now in the next step, we denote 1 by an open parenthesis and zero by closed parenthesis. And then we do cyclical parenthesis matching. That is, we match the closest pair of ones and zeros. Okay, so let's do that. So we match this pair of one, one and zero. We match this pair of one and zero. We match this pair of one and zero. So one more one is remaining. So we match this one with the first zero. Note that this matching is actually cyclical, which is allowed in our case. Okay. So once we have all these matched zeros and ones, the next step is to complementing to complement them. So we there's a function f which actually complement the matched bits. Okay, so we get another bit string which is fx. So in this case, the matched ones of x become zeros in fx, and the matched zeros of x becomes ones in fx, and the unmatched zeros of x remain as they are. Okay, so note carefully that in the bit strings x and fx, ones 
none of the ones are at the same positions. Okay, so this comes from the construction of the function f because we are complementing the ones. So ones cannot be at the same position in both x and fx. So we when we take the set uh, set correspondence of these x and fx, we see that those sets will obviously be disjoint. Therefore, this means that x fx is actually uh, an edge in the Nasser graph. Okay. So when we repeatedly apply this function f, what we get is a cycle. Okay. But that may not be a Hamilton cycle. Okay. And when we apply this function f on all the vertices of the Knesset graphs, we see that it, that partitions all the vertices of the Knesset graphs into different disjoint cycles. All right. So let me give you one concrete example. So on the right hand side, we have the Knesset graph when n equals 6 and k equals 2. So, and we start with some arbitrary vertex, let's say 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, which in the set notation is 1, 2. And we apply a function f on this and we get the vertex 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, which is the set 3, 4. Then we have marked the corresponding edge in the Knesset graph. We apply this function f again and again and we see that after the third application, we come back to the same vertex. This means we get a cycle of length 3 in the Knesset graph, k6, 2. But note that this only covers three vertices of the Knesset graphs. We need to cover all, all of them. Okay? So we start with some uncovered vertex, let's say 1, 3. And again, we keep on applying these functions f. And in this case, we get a blue cycle of length 6. But again, we see that some of the vertices are still not covered. So we continue this process until all the vertices are covered. Okay. So now that we have covered all the vertices, we see that there are four different cycles in a cycle factor. Okay. So this was the first step of constructing a Hamilton cycle in the Knesset graph. So we now have a cycle factor which have four cycles and it covers all the vertices of the Knesset graphs. And the next step is to join them together. However, before that, before that step, the another main important step is to understand the structure of these individual cycles. Because understanding the individual cycle structure will actually help us to join them together in the last step. Okay. Let me explain this by a very simple example of the Knesset graph when k is 1 and n is 15. Okay. So we start with some arbitrary bit string on this Knesset graphs and see its evolution under the repeated application of f. Okay. On the right hand side, we colored the matched zeros and ones. Okay, so the matched one is actually colored by the dark red, and the light red actually represent the matched zero. Okay. And these two matched bits form a glider. Okay. And we can also view this one application of function f as one time step okay and say that this glider moves forward by one unit per time step similarly when k equals 2 the four matched bits here they form a glider and we say that glider moves forward by two units per time step okay. so glider is a set of matched ones and zeros and we have a speed associated with the glider, okay, which is equal to number of ones or number of zeros because the number of ones and zeros match zeros, they are the same because of the parenthesis matching. So it doesn't matter by whether we take number of ones or zeros. So on the left hand side, the speed of the glider here is one. And on the right hand side, the speed is two. Okay, now let's take a little more complicated case when we have two different kinds of gliders in a bit string. Okay. So in this case, there are two gliders. One is of speed one, which is the red glider. And another is of speed two, which is the blue glider. So after one time step, we see that the red glider moves forward by one unit. Okay. And after one time step, the blue gliders move forward by two units. Okay. And now this motion of gliders can be formally written using the equation of motion. Okay. So for each of these gliders, we write the equation of motion, and which is st equals vt plus s0. 
So S0 is the initial position of the glider. Okay. And ST is the position of gliders after time t. Okay. And time t is the number of times we have applied the function f because one application of function f is considered as one time step. So t will be equal to number of times f is applied. And v is the speed of the glider. However, note that unlike this case, gliders may not be so nicely separated. They could be interacting in a very complicated way. And in such cases, the motion of the glider is non-uniform. However, in this talk, I have not mentioned the equation of motions in such cases. Okay, That is beyond the scope of this talk. Now, let me explain what glider partitioning are. For this, let's take a vertex in the Knesset graph when n is 18 and k is 7. So, recall that parenthesis matching actually gives the matched ones and matched zeros, okay? which was a very simple procedure where we simply match the closest pairs of zeros and ones. And in this case, again, the filled boxes are matched ones and zeros are, and the zeros are represented by unfilled boxes. However, recall that glider, we were assigning these matched zeros and ones to glider, but from the parenthesis matching, parenthesis matching, it is not so obvious to get that which matched bit belongs to which glider. And assigning these matched bits to glider is actually called glider partitioning. Okay, so this is actually a complicated process. So going from black and white to color, boxes is actually complicated. So internally, a recursion is happening, which is... Uh, responsible for assigning the match bits to gliders. Okay. Now, why are we doing this glider partitioning? Okay. The, so the, important, the, imp the importance of the glider partitioning is that it helps us to understand a very important property of a cycle, which is going to be crucial in the last step when we join these different cycles from the cycle factor together into one Hamilton cycle, which is, that the speed set of the gliders in a cycle is actually an invariant. Okay, so now we are at the last stage of the construction of Hamilton cycle, which is like the gluing all these cycles in a cycle factor together. So let's consider two cycles, C1 and C2. Let's say X, Fx are the vertices on cycle C1 and Y, Fy, these are the vertices on cycle C2. So we find a pair x, y such that x, f, x, y and f, y is a four cycle. Okay. And we use this four cycle to join these two cycles C1 and C2 together. And how we do it is we um, remove the older edges that is x, f, x and y, f, y from cycle C1 and C2 respectively and join them together using the horizontal edges which, is, which are x, f, y and f, x, y. And since we have already assumed that n is at least 2k plus 3, we know that such four cycles exist in Knesset graphs. Okay. And now using all these four cycles, we can join different cycles in a cycle factor together into one big cycle. Okay. But we have to be careful. Okay. So joining, doing cycles must be edge disjoint. That is one edge of a cycle cannot be used to join two different cycles, okay? It can it can only be used to join one X, one more cycle, okay? So now we have all these different cycles in a cycle factor, but how do we make sure that all of them are actually joined into one cycle, okay? So for that, what we do is we find a pair X, Y, such that the speed set of gliders increases lexicographically, okay? So, we call that speed set of a glider in is actually a cycle invariant. So these two cycles, C1 and C2, they can be characterized by giving a speed set of a glider. Okay. So let's say for C1, the speed set of the glider is 4332, and for C2, it is 4431. So it's easy to see that 4431 is lexicographically higher than 4332. So these two cycles can be joined together. However, we do this joining in a smart way, that is in a control way, I would say. So we join these two cycles 
only when the speed of the slowest glider decreases by one and the speed of some other glider increases by one, okay, which is exactly happening in this case. So the speed of the smallest glide, slowest glider, which is two here in cycle C1, it decreases by one. And the speed of some other glider, which is three in C2, it increases by one. Okay. And then we can join these two cycles together. And this ensures connectivity and Hamiltonicity. How? Because since we are joining the cycles, uh, considering the lexicographically, the, uh, so since we are joining these cycles together such that the speed set always increases lexicographically, this means that there is always a path from one cycle to the cycle which has the speed set that is lexicographically the highest, okay? This means all these cycles are actually connected, which means that we have actually one Hamilton cycle, okay? And this, we can construct a Hamilton cycle in a Gneiser graph. Now, before ending this talk, I want to uh, mention few open questions. So we first is about the efficient algorithm. So in order to generate the next vertex in the constructed Hamilton cycle, we want to know whether a polynomial time algorithm that is polynomial in terms of n and small k, does that algorithm, such algorithm exist? Right now, we, don't, we are not aware of any such algorithm. And also remember from the earlier slides that, uh, Lova, that Lovash's conjecture from 1970, where he said that or connected vertex transitive graphs are Hamilton, that conjecture is still wide open. We are also interested in, an, in studying Hamilton decomposition of Gneiser graphs, which is partitioning the different edges of Gneiser graphs into disjoint Hamilton cycles. Okay. So thank you very much for listening.